2010, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's there in my slide as well. So. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, inaugural lecture, a, a, a tradition in the what is now the Faculty of Science and Engineering, which was started by, or restarted by Arasso, our current associate dean of research innovation and impact. So, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Hans Sienz. I'm Interim Pro Vice Chancellor, Interim Deputy Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering. I do apologize, it's the longest title of the university. Um, well, welcome to you all uh, to, uh, uh, to listen to Chinzia about uh, what she's going to talk about. Uh, naturally, uh, inaugural lectures are a fantastic opportunity uh, for our colleagues um, to celebrate with, uh, with Chinzia in this case case uh, important professional and personal developments um, with family, friends, and colleagues. Um, uh, all the achievements of what you've done, and the many more things which will come, I'm sure, in research, teaching, innovation, uh, and uh, engagement. Now, uh, uh, Cinzia um, came to Swansea in 2010, um, joining the Astute Project, uh, and then she abandoned the project very soon to start an <laughs> academic career. Uh, and it was only yesterday uh, when uh, I was on the interview panel to, to get you into the astute team, uh, and now you're a professor in mechanical engineering. So that itself speaks for itself. Uh, this uh, career trajectory, you got your engineering doctorate in 2015, and between 2018 and 2021, uh, you became a recipient of the UKRI Tesla Manufacturing Fellowship. So, Again, quite an achievement, a high standing in the community and recognition of your work, your expertise, and so on. You're also a uh, co-director of Matthias Made Smart Research Center. There are only very few in the country uh, funded, uh, uh, funded in the last round, and Chinzia is uh, a key member of one of them as a co-director representing the Swansea activity in, in the world. And naturally, you're also a co-investigator of the doctoral training center, uh, which uh, trains and nurtures future leaders in this area. <coughs> Jinsi is passionate about uh, developing innovative technologies and tools. Uh, transformational impact is always high on the agenda for her to make sure that what is done actually changes things. It's not something uh, which is uh, it's done for its own sake, but it has got a purpose moving forward and uh, developing further. So without uh, uh, Religion has made significant contributions to the development of data-driven approaches, proof efficiency and sustainability, manufacturing processes, digitalization uh, in steel, metal, and packaging in the automotive industry. Naturally, uh, I think you've benefited from your prior career before coming into academia uh, because you've worked a, a decade in industry. But you've heard enough about her uh, for me now. Uh, over to you, Cinzia, and we're very much looking forward to, to your lecture. About Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hans. I read the title, May Smarter the Impact of Digital Manufacturing for a Sustainable Future. So thanks, Hans, for the nice introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank all of you giving your time to listen to, you know, to my lecture. And um, I will talk about uh, um, my research, some of my achievement, but also the, the research topic in general. And the, the way I've done it, I've chosen some example of my research to also celebrate the people I work with. Because I think this, you know, the people you meet are the ones that define where you go. You see a picture here, and this is the little village I come from. This is called Beverino. This is in the hills near La Spezia. So I am the first one of my family to be graduated. And you know, I did, when I joined the university and when I graduated, I didn't have any plan to do an academic career. And here I am. So really, life takes you where you know you perhaps you didn't imagine to go. Okay, so this is the structure of my talk. I'll start with an introduction about myself, but I think Hans has already said a lot of things, so I'll shrink it down. Um, and then I'll talk about Industry 4.0 technologies and in particular an initiative, very important initiative called Made Smarter. I'll give some example of research and collaborations and then I'll share with you some reflection and outlook. 
Okay, so my early career, so perhaps you don't know that much about that. So my first degree is in mathematics. I graduated from Pisa University and I soon realized I like technology, I like computers, and I became quite knowledgeable in uh, software, in writing software. So I joined, I was lucky to join a big company called Italtel, which was soon acquired by Siemens, where I joined a department developing technologies, applications and software for the GSM network. So I started to work in the telecom industry, later on joined Motorola when we moved to the UK together with Piaggio, who got a, a, like his first postdoc in Oxford. Was very, very lucky to be able to contribute to technological development of such an important technologies like mobile phones that has transformed really our lives. And um, when we moved to Swansea again, because of Piaggio, uh, joining the Swansea University, again, I was very lucky to join a spin off company of the university where I led a small team of engineers, both hardware and software engineers. And among the other projects, we developed a, a product, Venturi Mini. It's a Bluetooth product from the initial concept until com commercialization. So 2010, I had a complete career change. At that time, first of all, I was looking for a job that would allow me to stay in Swansea. I must admit that uh, because my company was planning to move uh, in Berkshire. Uh, and also, I also wanted a job that would allow me to make an impact on society. So I wanted to something very intellectually stimulating that would enable me to uh, change things and change our society for the better. This is why I thought a research opportunity would be very good for me. So I joined a research assistant. I uh, um, undertook an engineering doctorate under the supervision and guidance of uh, Dr. Rajas uh, Ransing, who is here. And, um, and this is where I started to learn about data, how we can use the data to improve manufacturing processes, and this is where my passion started. Uh, soon after I finished my engineering doctorate, I moved to another project called uh, Cherish D, and this is where um, you know, uh, I started to kind of move away a little bit from Astute. And then I spent a short time there, but Cherish gave me really a new way of thinking, putting people at the center of you know, our technologies and also taught me about interdisciplinary thinking. Uh, then I was very fortunate to join as a senior lecturer in 2016, and I had the great opportunity to start my own research and career into Industry 4.0. Uh, so I think um, Hans has already talked about the CDT, the fellowship, and the May Smart, so I'll skip on that. And uh, you know, this is where it comes to today. Uh, you know, I'm now part of the Mechanical Engineering Department as a professor. Good, so I will now start uh, to talk about what is Industry 4.0. How many of you have you heard about that? Okay, good. Uh, Okay, fantastic. So where we are today is uh, we are in the era of what is called pervasive computing. So pervasive computing means that embedded systems, mini devices, mobile devices are all connected and they also become part of objects. So this means that the object, not only computers uh, or us with through mobile phones, but all the objects are, are connected. We have this everywhere. We have in our smart city to monitor air pollution, for instance, to monitor traffic, and we have in manufacturing to monitor the performance of these processes. We use our smartwatch that send a lot of data. So these all interconnected things are called Internet of Things. So these devices are all connected and the characteristic is that they are on the internet and they can exchange data real time. So we can use this data to make better decisions. And as you can see from this chart, it is estimated that 41.2 billion devices will be connected by 2025. So, of course, this is bringing fundamental changes to our societies, to every aspect of our society and also to industry. So these changes are kind of labeled under the umbrella term of Industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution. So this is a new developmental stage in the industrial production where all these connected things, connected systems, connected processes, connected people can exchange data real time and we can use this data to make improvement. So this system becomes self-optimized, they can do diagnosis and they can um, react to changing circumstances. Another concept is that we, through this flexible system we can now mm, make products that are personalized. 
So um, the term Indus 4.0 was originated uh, in the, during the Hanover Fair in 2011, and then uh, this document set out the vision of Indus 4.0. The UK came, came a little bit, so it originated in Germany, of course, and the UK came a little bit of later. And there was a review that was published in 2017. It's the May Smart Review. And this review set out the vision for the UK to become a leader in industrial digitalization, in Indus 4.0. Um, so this review highlighted the positive impact of faster innovation and adoption of digital <coughs> technologies and uh, also highlighted how this can lead to an increase in the manufacturing sector growth and importantly it can create jobs and also reduce CO2 emissions. So a lot of gain from the uptake of these technologies. And you can see here, I've talked about industrial digital technologies, and these are listed here, so there, there are many, additive manufacturing, ad, advanced robotics, integration, uh, Internet of Things, uh, data, and analytics. So my research focuses on the big data and analytics aspects, so applying big data and analytics to manufacturing processes. And you can see there are many drivers here, and the initial drivers for Industry 4.0 was economic growth, competitiveness and cost reduction, which sometimes means headcount reduction. But more and more, we are moving towards also another important goal that is sustainability. Okay, before I start to talk about uh, my example of research, just briefly I wanted to tell you about uh, uh, big data. So what is big data? Big data are data that are collected through this Internet of Things, and they are big because they come in large volume, they come in a variety of uh, format, they are noisy, they come at different speed, and we want to use the data to generate value. Uh, so what do we, do we use for that? We use something called machine learning. Uh, so with machine learning, uh, as probably you know, you've heard about that, but, but it's not new. So the first definition is in 1959. It's the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being programmed. So the power of machine learning is that we have a lot of data and the system can learn automatically from the data and extract rules, extract values. And machine learning is all around us, you know, in speech recognition systems, you know, if you use Cortana, for instance, in image and video processing, financial services, energy, and so on and so forth. And there is a lot of hype around using machine learning and AI um, in, in industry, and as you can see from this quote here. So what's my research vision? Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have now all these connected systems. They are connected through sensor. They can acquire a lot of data. And we want to use this data to generate better decisions, to make improvement to processes. But this is difficult. It is difficult because it requires integrating and synthesizing diverse streams of information and data from different systems. And some of this data is very noisy. And we need to um, use them to make correct decisions, which means because some of these decisions are critic, critical, safety critical or could be business critical. And so the research aim is to develop these new techniques, tools, interactions to be able to drive better decisions using the data. And I do collaborate with a lot of companies, steel and iron making, foundries, metal packaging, automotive, and I'll show you some of these collaborations. So before I start, um, I wanted to show you where it all started. And really, some of this idea and the use of machine learning and the, use, the need to develop better predictive analytics, we were already studying those you know, with Rajesh as part of my, my NGD. So this is the vision that has, Rajesh has put forward for a system, 7 Epsilon, that used the data in a better way to drive better decision and to, to generate process knowledge that help and support in process improvement, overcoming some of the limitation of the more traditional approaches. So this work, I think we did this work, we started this work before the Industry 4.0 concept. And at that time, machine, use of machine learning in industry was a niche area of research. So I think this work was in a way pioneering towards this idea that have now become more mainstream. 
Uh, I wanted to mention my fellowship, which was the vehicle by which I, I started to develop my own research path. And I did that not only through writing papers, but to, through having active collaboration, engagement, co-creation with industry. So you can see the output of, of my, uh, my fellowship. And really, I collaborated very closely with industrial partners, producing some use cases to show the, the, the way we can use this technology. So I will now um, start with some, a series of examples. Uh, and um, I start with one collaboration with Crown Technology, a metal cap packaging company. Um, we did a lot of work as part of the fellowship. And this is uh, me uh, visiting the Carlyle plant, beverage uh, can manufacturing plant uh, at the beginning of my fellowship. And this is uh, Yuhon Pan, who uh, is, was the leader uh, of the digital side of the company. So they were, they were, at that time, they were digitalizing their processes, collecting a lot of data. And I think once we visited Crown also at the beginning before, before this. Um, and uh, they had a lot of, you know, they were creating a lot of data, a lot of value. So we started to investigate how we can use this data to improve uh, production processes. Um, so this case study applies to uh, the drawing process. So the drawing process is part of be beverage can manufacture, which is a high speed, high volume production process. And this body maker, basically what they do, they just uh, transform this you know, little cup into the full um, the full uh, length can. And uh, they are, have, again, high-speed machine. They can produce 500 cans per minute. And um, they, they typically are the bottleneck because if something goes wrong with one or if, if one body maker slow down, then it can uh, um, increase polish, uh, can decrease output, and really affect the profitability of the line. So we investigated. We looked if we could use the data to build some predictive model of the machine speed to be able to predict the um, uh, machine speed, for instance, for the next 10 minutes or half an hour. So this predictive model gives the advantage that you know what is going to happen in the future, so you can use this to make some pre preventive actions instead of waiting until things go wrong. So we use this architecture, and this was the first time this type of network architecture, deep learning, uh, or AI, machine learning, let's call it, was used for time series prediction in smart manufacturing. We published two papers around that. One is the method itself, and the other, how we can make the deployment of this model more scalable. So if we have this model, for instance, we can use them to balance production when things start to go wrong. Uh, sorry, and this is uh, Anikan, Dr. Anikan Essian, was a postdoc that worked in the, the fellowship and is now, as I said, a successful career move, is now working in Bristol as a lecturer. Okay, mm, I do a lot of work with Tata. Tata is one of my main collaborators, and uh, I wanted to present here some of the work I'm doing as part of uh, engineering doctorate. So some of the work is work in progress, but I think it's useful to show the, the breadth of, you know, the application of AI to um, manufacturing processes. So first one, uh, Sami, Sami is here, <laughs> and um, uh, Sami is working with uh, the tons of data that are collected at hot strip mill. And we know that steel is one of the core pillars of our society. And every year, millions of tons of steel are rolled by steel companies across the globe. But unfortunately, defects still occur. And these defects are very costly, not only in terms of profitability, but also cost to the environment. And despite the fact that large amount of data are collected and steel companies are really very advanced in terms of how much data they can collect, the procedures to find defects and to eliminate, to associate this defect to root causes is still um, done manually and it requires a lot of time. So we are trying to automate this through um, integrating different machine learning models that are able to predict the fact looking at the data that is collected at the plant and also uh, integrating different data and looking at this different data, try to correlate the fact to root causes. And we are now, we have developed already the model we are now putting in a framework. Um, another work we are doing here to leverage advances of computer vision. So 
One of uh, the more common uses of AI is in computer vision. So we, um, we are using tools that are existing to be able to, and we want to apply them to manufacturing processes. So we use computer vision systems to be able to track, um, to remotely track processes. In this case, we want to um, track the movement of hot metal ladles. And uh, basically, we want to track both the movement, but also we want to understand the severity of the emission that are produced um, by this. And uh, we do this, and I've got a video, uh, just by using some deep learning. I mean, it, it, this required a lot of time because, as you see, the image is a bit blurred. So we are able to track the movement and to track the flame severity. We are currently validating this one. And uh, a tool like this can be used really to optimize this type of process. Okay. Um, another work I'm doing with Tata is uh, looking at uh, predictive modeling of the silicon content uh, in the hot metal in the blast furnace. Again, this is a project that is taking a lot of time because uh, the blast furnace is a very complex uh, thermochemical reactor. It's very difficult to try to model from first principles, and we are exploring ways in which we can use the data to be able to make this prediction. So predict prediction of the silicon content can help to improve the thermal control with obvious advantages in terms of efficiency and also in terms of environmental impact. We have a model which is not perfect and this is a data-driven model. Um, it works very well to detect an increase of silicon content, not that well to detect a decrease of silicon content. So we are using now looking at hybrid modeling that combine model you know, from first principle to with data-driven models. A um, couple of more things. Uh, um, this is the work I'm doing with Ford. Ford is uh, sponsoring two engineering doctorate. Um, and we are looking at the development and integration of Industry 4.0 capabilities in the automotive industry. Um, so this is a project that Jay Flynn has done um, and uh, is looking at anomaly detection. So again, we have a lot of data. We can use this data to detect anomaly. In this case, we apply to a process that is called the rat noun down process. And uh, this is very simply fastening bolts into the engine. And this is done through an Andel tool or through robots. But the problem is that if this is not done correctly, this can cause problem with warranty and problem along the line with the engine. So it is estimated that 10% of the warranty claims might be due to errors in this process. So trying to find this error earlier on, it's essential and it can bring many huge cost savings. So, um, Jay has developed this tool and the company is very happy and they are now deploying this tool within, uh, I mean, and testing it within uh, the engine plant. Another work we are doing with uh, Alex, um, here um, Ford is interested to develop a novel way of collaborating with the robots. So we are looking at uh, um, voice interaction with robots in a noise environment. You all use, you know, we know speech recognition has made tremendous advan advances, but if we are in a noise environment, it does not work. So we are doing some uh, research around this area. Finally, this is a little bit out of topic in terms of Industry 4.0, but this is, this is to show you that I also do application to other areas and you know, these are, again, useful. This is some work that I've done with Grazia. Grazia was formal here at Swansea University, and we are uh, doing some work around the prediction of power disturbances in the electric grid using, again, machine learning, deep learning, and this kind of tool, so really leveraging these advances. So, I finish with my example. As I said, I've chosen this example just to acknowledge the people. Um, so uh, if I think about the research we've done so far, I think our research successfully demonstrates the application of AI, data, knowledge-driven approaches to drive productivity improvement and sustainability. I've shown an example of that, many examples, and I couldn't go into any details of this technique, but you know, I would be happy to explain another time. 
Um, and really, the utilization of this technique is uh, um, supporting effective adoption in Industry 4.0 technologies, um, leading to more efficient and sustainable process. The work that I do with company not only contributes to creating papers or to creating little case studies, but really improve their understanding of adoption of these technologies. And there are some case studies that did not go well, but produced a very good outcome for the company because the company realized that they, they needed to change the way they collected the data. So, as I said, despite all this, there are some examples, it's working, but the widespread, we are still far from widespread adoption of Industry 4.0. So we are still far from the vision that was set out in this document in 2012. Um, there are still a lot of barriers. You know, when we talk to companies, are you sure? Can we integrate this AI in the factory? Is it safe? Is it secure? Can we trust it? Do we have the right skills? So these are big, big questions that we need to answer. So we are not there yet, but we are working with organizations. And uh, I guess COVID came and, um, you know, I think some of our, uh, um, you know, ideas and, you know, the way of thinking about Industry 4.0 has changed. A, because of maybe COVID and also because of our climate crisis. So what we have had in the last year or so, it's a little bit a shift, okay? So now, while before we were thinking about Industry 4.0 in terms of growth, reducing <coughs> costs, you know, efficiency, now I think there is the need to think about Industry 4.0 in terms of more creating resilient systems. So we have all seeing the disruption of the supply chain that was caused by COVID and also to improve sustainability. So putting goals of reducing CO2 emission, reducing carbon footprint at the heart of it. And we can do this by putting humans at the center of the development of these systems. And this is what we have been advocating within our CDT even before this document came, okay? So we need to put people and human at the center of the technologies we develop. And only in that way, we are able to integrate this technology in a way that is meaningful and produce real outcome. So this is the vision, not set out by me, but that by this document about Industry 4.0, but I kind of share this vision. It's, it's an Industry 4.0, so it's kind of the next step and the focusing on societal goals. And so that, that goes beyond jobs and growth so that we can use digital technology to enable resilience and also to enable to respect the boundaries of our planet and also placing the well-being of people at the center. And these are some of the ideas that we are now developing within our new materials made smarter center. I've shown you at the beginning the document, the made smarter review. This document has been inspirational for me and for my research. The document, the review highlighted the need to create five research centers within the UK, and now I am co-leading one of those. And uh, within our research center, we are looking at digitalization of material intensive industry and the material thread. And we are not only looking at new technologies, but also we are looking at the societal aspect, doing this in a responsible way, and also looking at way we can actually change the perception we use and value materials. So we are exploring things like uh, materials as a service. Okay, I think I finished. Uh, so I would like to uh, now give some special thanks. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you to all colleagues and you know, all people from my department, but these are the people that I've mostly uh, Oh, I've got the wrong presentation. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Mm, I, I've missed a few people because this is not the, the latest version. Okay. Um, <laughs> I knew it would happen. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll mention those. Um, so, first of all, Hans, okay. So, I'm here because, you know, you and the other, the astute team welcome me here and allow me to change a career path in a kind of unexpected way. You've been my mentor, you've been my line manager, you have, uh, you know, driven a lot of my ideas, you have been my role model, so I'm forever thankful to you, Hans. Um, I, um, I received a lot of support from the impact team, both 
pre-beat, post-beat, and I'm thankful to them. Uh, Kate, sorry, I couldn't find Kate Williams, your picture, so it's not there, but I thank you as well. Um, then, uh, of course, I worked in, within the FMRI, and Hans was the first head of M FMRI. I would also like to thank Serena and Davide uh, for leading uh, the Future Manufacturing Research Institute. I'm thankful to Professor Matt Jones. Professor Matt Jones has taught me what people-centric, human-centric approaches means. It's given me the possibility to join Cherish. Cherish has shaped my career in terms of uh, understanding what interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary way of working means. And uh, Matt has given me the opportunity to join uh, the beat of the CDT. It brought me, it was uh, so brave to bring me to the interview and that was, uh, been, that's been a, an invaluable experience. Uh, I want to thank all my colleagues of the CDT. I was just lazy, so I copied from the website, <laughs> and it's me as well, but I want to thank all of them. I also want to thank uh, people I'm supervising, uh, um, Alma Mani and also Ashini, so you are one of the people missing here. <laughs> and uh, I'm co-supervised PhD student here. So I'm thankful to come, uh, play the piece, and Professor Kamp play, play the piece, and Professor Anno Beckman. I'm working with them in the Matthias Meismart Center and the Sustain. This picture probably you don't see. It's uh, mm, uh, our meeting of the Matthias Meismart Center, and Kayal, which is here, should be here. So thankful to her. And I want to give a special thanks also to a few people in the department, Rajesh Ransing, Andrew Ries, uh, Rajesh has been my supervisor, Andrew Ries has been my mentor, head of department, portfolio director, everything that has been an inspiration for me. Uh, Nick Levy, same thing, uh, um, has been my recent, recently my line manager, so I got a lot of support from him. Um, Christian, Chris Griffith, uh, we've done some work on robotics, I couldn't add, so I, this is my thank to him. And uh, Jen, where is she? <laughs> so thank you, Jen. She has been a friend. We have worked together in a studio. Now we are working both as academic member of staff with Jen. We are doing some research together, but also teaching, developing teaching and innovation in Industry 4.0. Um, I want to thank again all the faculty for organizing this event. I want to thank Antonio for being you know, um, head of our school. Harazu, of course, you know, head of our, our research. Um, few, a few new entries, Matt, uh, Carney, that you know, we are starting now this journey as co-lead of the um, Research Institute in Material Manufacturing. Uh, Katie Hepburn and Andrew King, where we are leading um, our, uh, the faculty strategy of the EDI. Hopefully I've not forgotten if I, I did. And then I want to thank my family, <laughs> Lisa, um, Daniele and Biagio. So Biagio is the reason why I am here and I've received in, throughout the years a lot of love, support and they really supported me you know, difficult times. I was writing my PhD thesis with two young kids and they you know, they've been very understanding, so I'm forever grateful to them. And this is a picture of us in Sicily just a few weeks ago. We were sponsoring Swansea University, <laughs> so I thought this is a nice picture. This is Modica, amazing place. And I wanted to tell you, if you don't know, that with Piaggio we also have a paper together, which was discussed while cooking some nice meal, I remember. So we have applied machine learning to phase transition, and uh, yeah, that's... The only last collaboration, but that's it. I think I finished. <laughs> ah, sorry. I, I want to, to thank my friends that are here. Yasmina, Adi, Giovanna, Natti. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me. No, 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 face transitions. <laughs> well, no, we, the idea came while we were cooking. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, excellent. So I think uh, we have open for some um, questions, discussions. So I'm looking at the audience. Antonio. 
I got a technical question. <laughs> With your expertise in the field, you presented a very interesting diagram about uh, hybrid modeling. The importance of starting to connect data modeling with just uh, computational modeling. Uh, what's your view on that? How do you think the, the, the scene is going to be set for the next uh, decade? Yes. Uh, I mean, this people are already doing it. And, and I think this is the key uh, to better adoption of these tools. Uh, we cannot only learn from data because we can learn from data only what is in the data. So it uh, will be absolutely key in order to develop good predictive model to include uh, you know, physics-based uh, more models from more uh, first principle is key. The future, I think, has got another component. I think it's also important to be able to capture the knowledge of people because uh, uh, with manufacturing system, they are Typically, they are very specific to an environment. So again, you might not be able to describe the system very well through principle or to data, from this first principle of data. So we also need some systems that are able to capture some existing knowledge. And we need to have better interaction between the knowledge of people and the knowledge of the system. So I, I actually see three things. One is the knowledge. You know, which is the knowledge that you acquire from book, from experience. One is the data driven and the one is the physics based. So I would add a third, third thing. And to me, this is the future. Yeah, I mean, um, I think um, it's probably not only the UK, so I don't have, I don't have data, so I'm just kind of speculating. But uh, if, we see, if we see the vision of Industry 4.0 that was set in the document, we are, we are not there yet. And of course, you know, I, as I said, my experience from UK that I can say is the cultural barrier, is the fact that people are adverse to change. People have been forced to change things during COVID, but not necessarily to make changes for the long term. And there is, uh, there is a report that actually says that the industry that were more ahead with digitalization reacted better to the COVID pandemic. So it's a lack of trust. It's a, it's a lack of skills, which we, you know, we are addressing already, we need to address. Um, so these are the cultural barrier. And I think also one barrier is that still companies are, they want to implement this technology to increase the bottom line. So unless they have a return on investment very quickly, then don't do it. So they look for kind of quick wins. Instead, this should be a more longer term vision towards really developing a more sustainable industry and change the way we make things, we design and make things, as opposed to just making a little bit more profit. So it's kind of this short term vision that I think affects the wider adoption. Yes, uh, so the mass concept of mass customization is that you want to um, optimize, you know, to, to personalize product. And again, I think that would be a brilliant thing. In order to do that, you need to have some flexible manufacturing system whereby you can change production very quickly to be able to do this. And you need this IT system. So again, I think we are, you know, we've made progress. Uh, if you see again, the ventilator challenge and you know, these things that we have been able to produce very quickly, this could be maybe some nice examples of the way maybe we can change a little bit uh, a machine to, to fit some customer needs. So yes, I mean, absolutely, again, if you're able to produce goods that are customized, that last long, that are made near where is needed, then of course you can contribute to sustainability, so. Uh, the examples you showed were very complex, but effectively there were single factor examples. Uh, how do you see uh, the development across the supply chain where you might have uh, factories around the world distributed with different levels of digitalization? How, how do you see that? Yeah, again, uh, very fascinating fields and something uh, 
I'm starting to do a little bit more research. I haven't done that much into the supply chain, but uh, I mean, one of the real advantage of Industry 4.0 would be to really digitalize the supply chain and being able then to exchange information across the value chain so that you, know, you can react to you know, change in material variability and so on. And uh, you know, if we think about still a lot of things you know, to gain in, term of, in terms of maybe traceability of materials, how we can reuse the materials at the end of life. Uh, the main barrier there is really we are, uh, okay, one is the cultural barrier. Companies don't want to share data, so we need some secure way to share in the data, and we are work, doing some work you know, with Arnold about blockchain. And um, so this is, this is very important. And the other is data inter interoperability. So different companies have different data set, so different data schema, so we need to find better models. So again, we are doing some future work around using semantic technologies to be able to create this, uh, inter you know, this interoperability, interoperability uh, across the value chain. So very important. I think this is gonna be a key area of research and uh, is something I'm starting to probably move into in the next maybe month or year. Sorry, I? Yes, yes. So this is some of these concepts that uh, are here, uh, you know, relate to industrial internet of things, which means data collected from, uh, um, from manufacturing processes. So this is a more uh, generic, gener I mean, IoT is a mo it's broader term. Uh, in terms of in industrial internet of things, uh, of course, there are challenges because the data comes, uh, you know, at different level from the machine to the plant to the business level. So there are, uh, you know, we, we are looking at those, but not, I'm, my research is not around the data platform for storing those type of data. Um, but again, there are issues there in terms of synthesizing. Yeah. Real time ML, AI, AI yes, yes, yes. It could be, okay. You can, you know, you can develop. So you are talking about more at the control level. Yes. There are, you know, there is research about, you know, using those for predictive control the machine learning. The problem is that, as, as I said earlier, you only learn the pattern that have happened. And you can a little bit extrapolate, but not that much. So in a way, you need to have some model that you can retrain fast to be able to adapt maybe to the changing circumstances of your system. So yeah, there is some research in you know, using more for kind of predictive control but there are still some issues in terms of the, the reliability of those models. Sorry? I think, again, I think you need both, probably. Hmm? You, need, you need both. Uh, but you need to capture the dynamics of the system. Only ML, is, you cannot really trust it. Mm, mm, mm. It's, it's not going to work, unless the system, it's, um, unless it's a simple system that, you know, it's, you know, you can capture all the dynamics from the data. So that's, that's the biggest problem. I think some of them are warm to the idea. Hmm? Uh, I think if you think about construction companies, they, you know, I think you know, they, they probably are the ones that are more advanced. They already collect the material that they use and they've got databases. So they are the one probably at more advanced level. There, is, there are also some European projects around that um, uh, material passport for constructions. I think uh, this is um, an idea at its, in its early days. And we are not yet at the stage where people want to share data. And unless, you know, you can only build a material passport if people, and if we have ways of sharing the data. 
people want, you know, they, they like their data, they don't want to share, so whether if we have a secure way to share it. So we need there to address some technical barriers as well. So I think people like the idea, but it's, it's still a little bit, in my opinion, uh, at its infancy. And I see the construction, you know, um, being maybe a bit the driver of that, construction companies. Very, very quick one. You know the Ford example? Yeah. Where you said the model is being uh, kind of experimented. I mean, you also told a little bit about, you know, return on investment. How receptive companies are to adapt these new models? Uh, okay, in that specific case, I tell you, I didn't mention, I mean, Jay is actually now working within Ford, so he's uh, completing his thesis and he's already been given um, you know, job opportunity to work there. I think they are, and I think, uh, um, you know, they came to us uh, uh, to f found an NGD. I mean, this is kind of, I think, a very good example of successful project. They came to us because they wanted to see things that they didn't explore. So they wanted another, another one thinking differently. So Jay has done this work and I mean, they are now, I mean, to deploy it needs a lot of coding because it's not so, so straightforward, but they are keen to trial it because it's gonna save them. I mean, I do have a cost analysis which I could not show here because I didn't know, but you know, it's gonna save them a lot of money. Yeah, so hopefully we have some good investment studies. <laughs> I don't want to put too much pressure, but yeah, right. yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Cynthia. That was a very informative uh, one. I mean, this is about celebrating your success through the inaugural lecture. I think we really want you to cherish mm. today and remember forever, right? Your family is here, so we have organized a little bit of a small gift <laughs> to remember your day. Wow. So on behalf of the faculty, <laughs> once again, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.